I wanted to start off with a more somber note um, of what you referenced um, in your speech, talking about the tragic loss of life of the three US service members. Um, is that, I realize it's still early days in terms of what happened, um, but counter UAS, counter drone systems have been a big topic. It's an area where a lot of companies are trying to innovate. Is this an area where there are lessons to be learned from that and ways to accelerate technologies to the battlefield? Uh, absolutely. First of all, that I think is about our 165th attack on um, us using those sorts of techniques, largely U, uh, UAS, but a variety of techniques. Um, this, one, this one hit. It took three U.S. service members and wounded many more. Um, and that is absolutely unacceptable to the United States. And, and um, you know, that's an issue that is being worked very closely, as I'm sure those watching the news have seen uh, by the president. Um, it is an area we have been very focused on, counter UAS, and yes, we absolutely know we need to continue to evolve there. So software-driven, Ukraine more than anywhere else has shown the pace, the rapid pace of iteration in terms of the development of the technologies and the capabilities. Again, a lot of it's software. There are some other aspects. Um, without the budget, it's very, very hard for us. Um, there are great limitations on what we can do under a continuing resolution. We have some rapid acquisition authorities. We are using everything we have. But they're just, frankly, limits to not having the government functioning as it should. And we need that, we need that um, 2024 budget. On Replicator, which you both acknowledge there's a lot of excitement and also questions about it, it sounds like you're committed to the August 2025 mm -hmm. timeline for it. What is the metric for success? <laughs> when you get to that point, what are the concerns? What are the things that would say that didn't quite work out as we planned or that worked out great? How do you measure yeah. that? I think there are a couple different measures. The first is, did we meet that goal, thousands multi -domain, across multiple domains in the thousands in the timeline 18 to 24 months? We know it's an audacious goal. We set it at the beginning. Um, I'm confident we're doing um, everything on track to get there. We're going to meet that goal. But the real uh, payoff, even though that's real payoff to the warfighter, if you talk to the Indo-PACOM team, they're very excited by what we, we hope to deliver. Um, the real payoff is you know, not trying to hack the system in one particular way, but to transform the system at DOD. Replicator, as I said, is the latest of our efforts. It actually quite very clearly, for those who are kind of following the game, um, building on work we've done in Raider and CAP, sorry to throw out more acronyms, um, but that very clearly driving down the risk, burning down risk for our processes inside the building, trying to identify where we are in our own way or maybe where there's some frozen middle issues that get stuck. So another aspect of success beyond the immediate is are we able to then take this, bring it into other areas and uh, transform the system to speed it up? Mm -hmm. Another thing you talked about is just this tremendous level, um, amount of private investment, venture capital going into defense. Um, we recently wrote about the 100 billion that's gone in since 2021. But one of the concerns from those companies and from those investors is that it's not being matched yet by acquisition dollars. Is that a concern for you? And how do we actually change that? Yeah, so first of all, I think that what I really would um, hit that our procurement budget request for 24 is, is you know, the highest in the peacetime you know, era, second highest in the peacetime era in 35 years. Um, so it's not that we don't have money going into acquisition. The question is, what are we acquiring? And are we acquiring what the warfighter needs? And are we acquiring everything we think the warfighter needs? Well, we've always had to make hard choices. So there's no surprise that w we will continue to have to make trade-offs. I think what I would stress is, as we um, innovate and move through the changing nature of warfare, again, shaping that changing nature of warfare, we know so much of what is in that shift is software defined um, and is also could be produced, manufactured much more rapidly through um, advanced manufacturing. There are a lot of um, areas, biotech, I could think of others, that are driven right now by the commercial sector. So as we shift in the nature of warfare, there's more and more opportunity for non-traditionals and service providers to be a part of that procurement story. So lots of dollars going to procurement, that's not the issue. Um, the issue is, are we able to buy what we need and, and are we thinking far enough ahead to what the shape of warfare needs to be? So what, in that view, does the defense industrial
industrial base look like? And you know, we could say five years, 10 years time. Are there more than five primes? Are there a dozen primes? How does that actually look in terms of, of a successful change in strategy? I don't think there's a pre-definition of number of primes. I think the, it is important to have competition in the defense industrial base. There's no doubt about it. And we know um, small business is a huge driver of that. <coughs> Pardon me. So we work very hard on trying to drive up the percent that is coming, uh, percent of our procurement and investment that is going to those small businesses, <coughs> with apologies. Uh, but I don't think. I would try to guess here today how many primes there would be. I, I think the whole nature of what constitutes the defense industrial base, we need to shift that, that, that mental model. Um, the American industrial base is the defense industrial base. We obviously have traditional providers who we greatly value. We need them. We need them to stay at the cutting edge. Um, and we continue to work hard with them. But, but you know, it's very clear to everyone, including them, that teaming with other parts of the economy, understanding the new areas of innovation, compute others, um, is incredibly vital to growing where we need to go in defense. Mm. You talked about this long history of cooperation that goes back decades between Silicon Valley and the Pentagon. There have also been periods where there's been a rift, uh, most notably after the Vietnam War period, and then there was a big effort to heal that rift. Have we, we've clearly come a long way. Are there still issues there? Um, is there still a need to overcome some of the hesitancy of tech Silicon Valley to work with the Pentagon, or do you feel like we're pretty much where we need to be? I think that's a constant, um, a constant refrain for us, and, and we focus very much on, as a department across administrations, you know, I think there has been a strong focus on making sure that companies want to work with us. We know part of that is making sure we represent the values of the nation, um, and we, uh, we lean forward on that. Um, that's always been important for the United States in terms of bringing the commercial sector into work with government. So we continue to do that today. I don't think we are in a crisis phase, to use your Vietnam analogy. And I do think, as I said in my remarks, that the PRC did a lot of that work by comparison. And the types of um, uh, both their military activities and the types of um, coercive strategies they use working with companies have done a lot to turn others to looking to how you can work with us. Um, I will stress one area that we've been very clear about is our um, AI, responsible AI approach, and a responsible autonomy approach. That's decades long, but we continue to evolve it as the technology evolves. We have Project Lima right now, which is looking at uh, large language models. <clears throat> we, you know, safety is vital to effectiveness for us. These aren't trade-offs, they are one and the same, so we look at how to adopt um, innovations in a way that's safe to, for our war fighters and again reflective of American values and we'll continue to do that. You actually preempted my next question oh, which okay. is on uh, Lima, <laughs> on that task yeah. force looking at generative AI. Uh -huh. Where is it at? What, what, what do you see coming out of that? What are the issues it's looking at? If you could expand on that. Sure, so they are looking at hundreds of use cases um, to identify what are the right, what's the right framework for the department. This spring is when that information comes forward to the CDAO and then to me and the secretary thereafter. So I anticipate getting some feedback on where there are use cases that are ready to go today if there are those and other areas where we need to do more, more work. But we work closely with, the, with all the major um, generative AI you know, providers and would-be providers to make sure we're lashed up. We're very en enthusiastic to work with them. We just have to do it in a way that actually delivers for the warfighter. Um, you spoke about both Ukraine and then the challenge from China. Um, there have been a lot of new technologies deployed in Ukraine. In some ways, it, it, it's been almost, I think some people have compared it to a test lab mm -hmm. for things like UAVs, for drones. What are some of the lessons learned um, out of that from your perspective of the technologies that have been deployed there? Sure. I think uh, what I would stress for the U.S. really has been um, the proliferation of, of space, low Earth orbit satellites in particular, and communications that the commercial sector really drove. That's been a, a clear, that ability to communicate and, and have uh, mass that's distributed has paid off. 
Um, I think when you look at autonomy, it's, it's a more um, mixed picture in terms of exactly um, how it has evolved, where it has provided benefit, and we take all of those lessons away. I think one piece that the United States has an advantage on is, is uh, over other competitors is that when innovation happens down at the unit level, we know how to bring that up and scale it. We also need to make sure we do that exceptionally well and fast <clears throat> so that tactical innovations, TTP innovations that happen, software innovations that some very clever sergeant comes up with, for instance, which you see in Ukraine all the time, that sort of is lifted up and promulgated quickly across the force as we go through rapid iteration. So I think that's another lesson I would add. And then the last is Intel in general. The United States clearly has an advantage in intelligence that's paid off substantially. Um, and to the extent that we can help our partners with that, in this case, Ukraine, um, that you know that's an area we know is a strength to build on. That iter of process that you talked talked about, particularly coming down from the tactical level, yeah. how do you get that into the U.S. system? It's, it's an, it's an all-hands-on-deck. It comes at all kinds of different levels. We've really um, emphasized with the joint warfighting concept, making sure that there's rapid concept to experimentation to fielding. That's our radar initiative, excuse me, is one of those areas where we've really tried to highlight how do you quickly take um, a concept make sure you have the right testing environment, experimentation environment, the lab, if you will, the substitute for Ukraine for us, the, 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 the experiment and exercise realm for us out with our co-coms. And you see a lot of that innovation going on today, Southcom, CENTCOM, Indopaycom, others are doing a lot of that work. That's how we do it, really make sure we're testing it in the field with the warfighter closely linked to the technologist, so the operator and the technologist work together um, to do that rapid iteration. A lot of this too is again, concept of employment. So it's not just technology, it's about how do we use that technology best, and that's where we really can excel. We have the most incredible um, military service members. Um, they are uh, I individuals who are um, incented to bring forward their best. That is definitely a different model than authoritarian states. It feels like still sort of the, um, the biggest barrier, you talked about, you know, American ingenuity is where we have an advantage over China. It still very much feels like our acquisition process is the 300 pound gorilla. Can we get to where we need to be without fundamentally reforming Defense Department acquisition? I think we have to fundamentally reform defense acquisition, but we are down that path. We did have um, the alternative acquisition pathways, middle tier acquisition pathways, for example. We have to prove those out. Um, you know, we have to show that those pathways, software is one, for example. We've already put billions of dollars through that software acquisition pathway. Now we have to show our, our um, oversight committees that we can deliver through those alternate pathways because there is a different oversight model built into those. And it's really about trust between Congress and the executive branch to prove out that we can do good things with these tools that they've given us. So that's why we've been so focused in this administration on taking all those authority changes, showing we can make, we can advance against them. Replicator is an example of that. And then where we can build that trust, I think there's more opportunity to expand our authorities. So yes, we need acquisition reform. We're in acquisition reform now, and we need to build trust as we go through that. Turning back to Replicator for a moment, since you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been specific capabilities that have been selected. When do you think we'll learn about specific systems? So the systems we are talking to Congress about um, uh, in, in the immediate. Uh, so we're having those conversations right now at the system level. Um, expect to have um, those. Uh, uh, and we've been working with, sorry, let me step back and say, we've been already working with Congress. They know it's coming. The system level information comes forward in the next several days, as I said in my um, remarks. Um, when you'll know about them at the system level is a different issue. We have a classification guidance we're working through. It is not unusual for the Defense Department to keep some aspects of the systems that we are pursuing at a classified level. It doesn't mean that we are hiding them and we work very closely with Congress. There's nothing hidden from Congress. They have to approve all of that funding. Um, so we'll work closely with them and more to follow in terms of what we'll share publicly. Right. Are you surprised where we are now with, with tech in Silicon Valley compared to five years ago? I am. I, I think it, it, is, it is a marker for what's happened, I think, in broader world events. I think um, there's 
uh, more ability to see how you as an individual innovator or investor can contribute to the, uh, you know, to the American experience, to American dynamism, dare I say, um, and more concern about what the alternative might hold. We've seen that in Hong Kong, we've seen that elsewhere, and I think that more than anything has brought to mind what the risks are for uh, falling behind. It's a great way to wrap up. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much. All right, thanks.